Good morning. If you have your Bibles, I want you to open to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Put a marker there because we're going to come back to that. First Corinthians 15. And then once you've got that, flip over to Hebrews chapter 6. We have been working through a series on discipleship, and part of discipleship is understanding what our faith is about. And I figured what better way to start than what Scripture calls the elementary principles or the elementary doctrine of our faith. And so in Hebrews chapter 6, the writer of Hebrews, um, he, he's writing a letter. He wants to go in and explain some difficult things. But he can't because the listeners aren't ready. The, the people that he's writing to just aren't prepared for it. So we're going to back up into verse 11 of chapter 5 to kind of get the context. Okay. Whenever you read a verse that starts off with therefore, back up and understand why that's there. Okay, So back up in verse 11, uh, he's speaking about Jesus being the high priest. And in verse 11 he says, About this we have much to say, and it is hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again, the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Okay, so now we get to the, the section that we're kind of working out of. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and of instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. Okay. Now, if you notice, there's a progression of, of doctrines listed out here. There's six. We have covered thus far um, repentance from dead works. We looked at that and first we determined a, a dead work is anything that is not done unto God, done in the name of Christ. And, and that, that kind of changes our thinking because Scripture says whatever you do, do it all in the name of the Lord. So when you're at work, whatever your work is, whoever you are working for, do your work in the name of the Lord. Be a Joseph in the workplace. You look at the life of Joseph. He was sold by his brothers into slavery. And, and he was taken off. He was bought by Potiphar. And when he worked for Potiphar, he worked as unto God. And Potiphar recognized his diligence. And he soon became second over all of the house, second only to Potiphar himself. Well, then some things happened and he ended up going to prison. And what did he do there? Did he sit and bemoan his, his situation? No. He worked diligently such that the, the person in charge of the jail put him over all of the affairs inside the jail. Okay? Well, then the prophecy, he, he, he discerns uh, and interprets a couple dreams. Uh, the dreams come to pass. The discernment comes to pass. Uh, and... The baker is executed and the cupbearer goes back to Pharaoh and Pharaoh has a dream. Well, we have no idea how long it was, but we know there was a period of time from the time the cupbearer left jail until he remembered Joseph. All that time, Joseph was still in jail. He was not bemoaning the fact that he was forsaken, that he was forgotten. He was still working diligently. Okay? And then... The cupbearer remembers, Pharaoh has a dream, and he says, well, you know, when I was in prison, there was a man there who was able to interpret my dreams. Maybe he can interpret the dream for you. So Joseph comes out, and, and he interprets um, Pharaoh's dream, and, and, and guess what happens? He's put into a position of authority. But does he rest on his laurels? 
I mean, he's gone from the head of Potiphar's house to the head of the jail. Now he's the head of the kingdom. Second only to Pharaoh. Is that time to sit back and relax and enjoy life? I mean, most of us would think that, hey, I've arrived. I'm here. But what does he do? He sets himself about diligently managing all the crops, all the produce in the land, because he believed that the interpretation of the dream was that they would have seven prosperous years, and then there would be seven lean years. And he did such an incredible job that people from all the nations around were coming to get food from Egypt. As a matter of fact, he did such an incredible job that at this point in history, whereas the Pharaoh was a ruler, but he did not have possession of everything, it was not considered his, at this point it became his. Because the people came and said, hey, we don't have anything to eat. He says, okay, well here, we'll give you, you pay, they pay, well we don't have any money left, okay, we'll bring your animals. Okay, and then they exchange their animals. And they say, well, we don't have any more animals. Okay, we'll exchange your land. And, and by the end of this thing, Pharaoh owned it all. Not Joseph. Pharaoh. But it was because of Joseph's diligence. Okay, but see, if you're not doing this unto God, it's vain. It's dead. When you stand before him, there will be nothing to credit to your account. Okay, so and then we talked about repentance. We talked about repentance is turning away from, turning your face away from. Okay, you're convinced that what God says is true. That's conviction. Okay, and then confession. You agree. Hey, yeah, what God said is so. That's that's the way it is. And then there's repentance. Because you were convicted, because you confessed, you have determined to turn your course. That's repentance. Okay, so then we go on to faith towards God. And we spent actually several weeks talking about faith. This is one of the key elements. We call our system our faith. And we don't do that for no reason because Scripture tells us that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Okay? You understand that? That without faith, it doesn't matter how well you work. It doesn't matter how good of a job you do. Without faith, it merits nothing. Because many will say on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not blah, 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 blah. And he's going to say, I, I don't know you. I don't know you. So the cornerstone of our, our belief system is our faith. What is faith? Well, flip over a couple chapters. We'll get God's definition of faith. Flip over to chapter 11. <clears throat> I'm going to read uh, a few verses here. Um, I'm going to pick out a couple because this, this chapter is known as the Hall of Faith. Okay, this, these are uh, many of the men throughout Scripture who were commended for their faith. So, starting in verse 1, our definition is, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Now notice he says the assurance of things hoped for. Our hope is not in vain. We are assured that our hope is not in vain. But it's not like we're sitting there going, Well, gosh, I really hope I'm going to get to heaven. I really hope that his, his blood was enough and, and, and I've been forgiven and that there's something better. That, that's not really what's happening here. He has told us that his blood was sufficient. He has told us that because of his grace and the faith that he births in us, we can know salvation. Okay? So, the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen. This is huge. This is huge. Because our faith rests on a, a God that we cannot see. That refuses to have any images made of Him because every one of those images would fall so far short of who He is and what He is that it would be a blasphemy. Okay? You know, oh, oh God just doesn't like pictures of Himself? I don't think that's it. We serve an invisible God 
We are led by an invisible spirit. But he did not leave us blind, did he? Because he sent his son, who was the very image and impression of himself. So that's what we can look to. So going down a little bit, uh, verse 2, it says, For by it, by faith, the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Then I'm going to jump down. Verse 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. Okay? If you, one, don't believe there's a God, you can't have faith. Not, not salvation, not saving faith. Now, there's all kinds of faith. There's a lot of people out there today that have faith in God. They believe that He's there. They believe that He's real. But they are not going to make it into heaven. Okay, Because there's a, a measure of faith that is not unto salvation. Uh, James makes that clear when he says, even the demons believe and shudder. Okay, so, so we know there is a measure of faith, but there is a faith unto salvation. And, and part of that faith is, um, notice what it says, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists. But then look at that second part. And that He rewards those who seek Him. Are you in it for the rewards? Oh no, I'm, I'm holy and righteous. I'm humble. and uh, God says that He's going to reward you. I look at the Psalms. Uh, David wrote. And this was a man after God's own heart. And he reminded God of God's promises. And he stood believing that God would do what God said He would do. And he called on God to accomplish it. Read the Psalms. Look at the way that David thinks about, sings praise, and, and worships God. Do we have that kind of faith? To call out to God to be true to His Word? I want to flip over some more verses. Um, we're going to jump way down to oh, we're going to go to verse 32 I'm going to read a, a passage here and then I want to back up and I want to talk about this for a minute um, verse 32 what more shall I say now he has listed numerous people throughout the Hebrew Bible who lived by faith who exhibited faith Okay, he says and what more shall I say for time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, and Samuel and the prophets. He doesn't have enough room, he doesn't have enough time to go through the entire list. If he did, he'd just be recreating the Hebrew Bible. Okay? So he says, Who thought that faith, who through faith, conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Somebody click that in your head. Store that away for a moment, okay? Um, some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonments. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. <coughs> they went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated. Now I'm going to pause right there. There is a fallacy in the church in America today. There is this fallacy that the most important thing that God wants is for you to be happy. That's a lie. That's a lie. God wants you to have joy. But what does He want you to have joy in? Him. I hear so many people talking about, well, you know, God just wants me to be happy, so I'm going to do this. Look at the people that God is commending for their faith. You suppose these men that were sawn in two were happy? Oh, it, 
pickles. When Daniel went down into the lion's den, you know, Veggie Tales has a little twist on that. Because Daniel got to eat pizza with the lions. I don't think that was the case. I mean, what kind of pizza do lions eat? Right? No, but really, when, when Daniel was thrown into the lion's den, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fiery furnace, I don't think they were happy. But they were confident. They were confident in God, who even though He may not save them, was still worthy. Even though He may not save them, He is still worthy. I am not going to bow to your idol, because I serve the living God. And He has said that I will bow me to no idols. So even though you throw me into the fire, yet will I serve Him, yet will I praise Him. Okay? So, so let's get our thinking right. You want to be happy? You want true happiness, contentment, joy. It is only found in Jesus Christ. It is only found in intimacy with God. Now there are things in this life that will titillate. They'll, they'll tickle your pleasure for a moment. But ultimately they all leave you hollow. Because you can't reproduce and, and you, you've got to go deeper. You've got to go further. You've got to get more. See, all of sin is an addiction. We're addicted to our particular sins. And they, they, they want to keep us trapped and bound in those. But Christ came that we would be set free. So, so let's go on here, okay? Um, verse 38. Listen to what God says about these people. These that were sawn in two, they were imprisoned, they were flogged, they were beheaded. He says, of whom the world was not worthy. The world did not deserve them. Wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all of these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised. Their faith, what they were believing in, was yet to come. We're kind of in that middle place right there. Because we see in Scripture that there's not one advent of the Messiah, there's two. There's the first advent where He is the Lamb, led, led like a lamb to the slaughter. Where He becomes the uh, sacrifice for the remission of our sins, for our redemption. Okay, But, but that, that has happened. So we look back on that, thanking God that it has happened. But we also look forward, don't we? Because there is another coming. Coming. <laughs> and he will come a second time as the lion of the tribe of Judah and he will come with justice in his hand alright so let's, let's flip back over to chapter 6 um, I've already spent more time here than I wanted to um, ok faith towards God of instructions about washings uh, this, this literally is didache baptismos um, baptism teachings we talked about how throughout the Old Testament, baptism, washings, were used to make people religiously, uh, ceremonially clean. This was a constant reminder that their sacrifice was insufficient to take away their sin. All it could do was cover over it. So they would go down into the water and they'd come up and guess what? Life would make them dirty again, so they'd have to go back down in the water. See, this is the cool thing about our baptism. Our baptism is one and done. Because the sacrifice that we are holding on to was sufficient to not just cover over sin, but to take it away entirely. Okay? So, um, instructions about washings. And laying on of hands. We covered that uh, two weeks ago. Laying on of hands. The different uh, reasons that people were, had their hands laid on. And, and every time, it was significant because it was marking them out for something. Marking them. And, and we looked and, and the priests... They, they were, had hands laid on them and, and they were separated out. And, and the offerings, they had hands laid on them and they were separated out. And, and so we see um, oftentimes with, when they would appoint leaders in the New Testament, they would lay hands on them and separate them out. Okay, so we, we talked about that. And today we're looking at the resurrection of the dead. 
Now there's a couple things that I want to talk to you about before we get into this, because you need to understand that faith is the cornerstone of our belief system, but the resurrection is the fulcrum on which it rests. Okay? Because if you take away the resurrection, we are a people without hope. Um, how many of you saw the movie or read the book, The Case for Christ? Okay, I want to encourage you. The book is over there. You can check it out of the library. Or you can watch the movie. The movie is an excellent... Uh, one of my biggest frustrations uh, is that so many Christian movies are just horrible. They, they, just, they have terrible acting. They have terrible filmography. Uh, they, they, they just do not do a good job. Now, that's not to belittle them, because I'm glad there's at least that option for us. But the case for Christ, I thought they did an incredible job making the story believable and relatable. Okay? So Lee Strobel, he was a, a writer, an investigative reporter for the Chicago Tribune. Uh, he had received several awards. Uh, he was an avowed atheist. And... Um, he and his wife had agreed that, that uh, you know, the faith of their parents was, was silly and, and unnecessary and, and a fairy tale. Well, uh, after a, a series of events, his wife came to faith. And she confessed to him, you know, I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And, and he is at a loss because he, 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 you find out he wasn't, there, there really is no such thing as an atheist. They're anti-theists. Okay? Atheist means that they're just without God. And, and really, those that are without God that just don't really want to think about it and don't want to deal with it and really don't care, those are agnostics. Those are people without knowledge. But most atheists that are diehard atheists, I, I do not look they're anti-theist because it's not sufficient that they're, they don't believe in a God. They, you can't believe in a God either. <clears throat> Nobody can believe in a God. Okay, so he was really an anti-theist, and, and he determined he was going to use his skills as a writer, as an investigative journalist, and he was going to investigate the Bible. And, and he came down to one critical component, the resurrection. He, he figured if he could prove the resurrection never happened, then this whole house of cards that he thinks Christian faith is will fall down. Okay, so I would encourage you to watch the movie read the book, because as he's investigating and he's looking into these things and, and all of a sudden he's finding out that scripture is, is not just a, a fairy tale or a fable or a collection of moral writings, he's finding out that it's historical truth and it's got a solid foundation in reality. He comes to the point where he has to look at this and he has to, for the sake of intellectual honesty, he has to say, at the very least, this could have happened. And really, if he's honest, he's got to say, as most historians do, it did happen. Dr. Simon Greenleaf, he was the uh, um, royal professor of law at Harvard. He was another avowed atheist. He was challenged by his students to apply the rules of law as though they were a, in a court um, and consider the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, as an atheist, he thought for sure he would just tear this thing down and, and the Christian people in his class would be shown to be the fools that they were for believing. And, and applying... Now, now, keep in mind, this is a man whose writings are still looked at today and referred to today because of his... his legal acumen. He puts this entire thing, he puts the internal evidence, the external evidence, the eyewitness accounts, the, the life stories of those that were changed. And, and he basically he holds a mock trial of this and, and he comes to the conclusion that it had to have happened. I want to read you um, a quote. When he finished with his trial, he said, it was therefore impossible that the apostles could have persisted in affirming the truths they had narrated had not Jesus Christ actually risen 
from the dead. And had they not known the fact as certainly as any other facts. He's looking at the, the disciples' lives. The same disciples that scattered and ran away on the night that Jesus was arrested. Who, when he rose again, their lives changed. And they're willingly placing themselves in harm's way because of what they know to be true. Okay? So, the, the thing that we need to grasp and we need to hold on to here is that the resurrection of Jesus Christ was both literal and physical. Literal and physical. As a matter of fact, in our uh, uh, doctrine, our, our statement of biblical truths, um, we state that it is both literal and physical. There's a lot of people that out there say, well, maybe it was more of a... a uh, Oh, the word just ran out of my head. A, an allegory. Or, or maybe it was a spiritual resurrection. Or, or maybe it was, um, you know, something other. They, they saw the ghost of Jesus and not Jesus resurrected. Here's something that we need to adjust our thinking for. Because we live in a Western culture with Western thinking. We like to separate the body and the soul. We like to consider them two parts. But, but Scripture does not consider them to be two parts. They consider them to be two pieces of a whole. For example, uh, my finger is as much a part of my body as my ear. Okay? The finger does not make up the whole body, but it is a part of the body. And you can't separate them out without harm to the whole. Okay? So when Scripture talks about uh, the creation of man, we were created to be a tripartite being. Do you understand what that means? We were created in, with three component parts, body, soul, and spirit. Okay? And when Adam and Eve sinned, their spirit died. Their spirit died. And everybody since then has been born lacking that spiritual component of their creation. That's why when Jesus is talking in, in John chapter 3, he says that we must be born again, not just of the water, but also of the Spirit. Okay? That, that is our spirit being born, and we are finally put back into the nature of creation that we should have been. Okay? So we have a body, a soul, and a spirit, but you cannot separate them out. Once the Spirit is born in you, you can, you can ignore it, you can do things to refute it, but once it's born in you, guess what? It's there. It's there. The body and the soul, there are teachings, uh, I think back on the Gnostics from the book of Colossians, who taught that the body, the physical, was evil and, and therefore needed to be destroyed and only the soul or the spirit was good. And, and that's not a scriptural principle, folks. That, that's not a scriptural principle. If that were a scriptural principle and we had no longer any need for our body, why would Jesus have resurrected as the first fruits physically? If He resurrected as the first fruits physically and our hope is in our resurrection, not a hope saying, golly gee, I hope this happens. Our hope is that, yeah, we believe it's going to happen. Okay? God is going to resurrect our bodies. But when, when Jesus Christ was, was resurrected, was He resurrected in the same body? Yes, no. The body had identifiable marks that allowed the disciples to see the holes in his hands, the, the piercing in his side. But also, there, there must have been something different about it because when he was walking with the disciples on the road to Emmaus, they didn't recognize him. When, when the women saw him in the garden, at first they didn't recognize him. Okay. But also, he had something else unique going on. His new body transcended time and space. What I mean by that is, the disciples were in the room, the door was locked. And Jesus appeared in the middle of it. 
Okay? Doesn't say he snuck in a window. Doesn't say he crawled under the carpet. It says he appeared in their midst. Okay? I can't do that. I don't think many of you can either. Okay? But not only was he able to, to, to pass through locked doors, but, but he was also able to jump from one place to the other. Because Scripture tells us that he was here, and then immediately he was somewhere else. Okay? So his body is definitely different than ours. All right? So, you got 1 Corinthians 15 marked? Flip back there. Because this is where it's at, folks. First Corinthians 15. <clears throat> We're going to read the majority of the chapter here because this is the scriptural treatise, the, the scriptural teaching on resurrection. All right? So, Paul's writing says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scripture, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. I love that statement. By the grace of God, I am what I am. Boy, if we could just rest in that, mm -hmm. by the grace of God, I am. Man, it's only because of God's grace that I've got, I've got anything that I've ever come, however far I've come. And His grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. That was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether they, uh, whether then it was I or they, so we preached, and so you believed. Okay, so this is all a massive introduction. But the key phrase that we've got here is, is the gospel that they received was that Christ died for their sins. He was buried. He was raised on the third day. That's, that's the gospel. Okay? Now, there's more to the gospel we know because why did he have to die? Okay? Um, so coming down to verse 12, we just kind of got in the intro. It says now... Uh, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be mis misrepresenting God because we testified about God that He raised Christ whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. See, uh, what, this is what we're teaching you, and, and you're, you're saying that the dead aren't raised. Well, if the dead aren't raised, then Jesus wasn't, day, wasn't ra raised, and everything that we've told you is a lie. And not only that, God's a lie. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. And you are still in your sins. See what I'm talking about? It's the fulcrum. It's the center on which our faith stands. The foundation is faith. Because without faith, you'd never believe any of this. Okay? But this is the actual event that, that our, our faith system rests on. It says, um, Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Wow. This is Paul who has laid out two-thirds of the New Testament for us. 
And, and he is saying that if this did not happen, man, of all people, we are the most to be pitied because we believe a lie. Okay? But, okay, thank God for that. But, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. First fruits. Tag that in your brain. This is important. Okay? Uh, actually, let's just deal with that right now. Were people raised from the dead before Jesus? Yes. Yeah, there were a lot of them. Uh, we know Elijah. Uh, we know Elisha. I mean, Elisha, I mean, the guy's dead. He's in the tomb. He's nothing but bones. And the raiders come and they're trying to bury some guy that had passed on. They're like, well, hey, let's just throw him in here so we can go and hide. And they chuck the guy into the tomb and his body lands on Elisha's bones. Can you imagine the shock that that guy had? <coughs> Wakes up and he's in a tomb. What is going on? <coughs> we know that Jesus raised the, the widow of Nain. We know uh, Jairus' daughter. We know that Jesus raised people from the dead. Lazarus raised from the dead. But why is Jesus then the first fruits if others had been raised before him? Others all died. That's exactly right. Because he was the first to be raised immortal and imperishable. Never to know death again. Matter of fact, poor Lazarus, uh, when Jesus resurrected him from the dead, the, Phar the Pharisees came and they started checking into this and started doing this. And then, and then when they realized how many people were following Jesus because of this miracle of, of raising Lazarus from the dead, what did they decide to do? And, oh, yeah, we're going to kill him. It's not enough that we kill Jesus. We've got to get rid of this guy too. I mean, Jeepers Crime, can you imagine if they had to get rid of everybody that Jesus touched? There wouldn't be anybody left. All right, coming back here. So Jesus is the first fruits, uh, the first type to be resurrected into newness of life that will live forever, not encumbered in any way by sin. All right? Um, for as... By a man came death. By a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam, all die. <coughs> Something for you to keep in mind. This verse right here. This is talking about the sin that we are born into. This is the hereditary sin passed down from Adam to all of the people that came after him. Okay? So... Um, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Not Now, now keep, keep understanding here. Paul is not making a blanket statement speaking about every person in creation. Okay? Who is he writing to? Believers. He is, he is speaking specifically to believers with the understanding that they have already been taught that all are, have sinned that all need salvation, that all need redemption, that all need a blood sacrifice paid on their behalf. Okay? So when he's saying that all shall be made alive, what is that contingent on? Well, faith. faith. Right. The foundation. Faith. Okay? Uh, but also, in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Keep that thought in mind here. Because we're going to see there's a progression of resurrection. Alright? Um, we're going to jump down a little bit. Um, Verse 29. Otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people being baptized on their behalf? Why are we in danger every hour? I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die every day. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Does anybody know what that, that statement is? He's actually quoting something here. This is the, the motto of the Epicurean line of thinking. Uh, at this time in Rome, there were two lines of thinking uh, as to how you should live your life. There were the Epicureans 
who believed that everything was in vain, so you may as well eat and drink, make merry, because you're going to die anyway. And then there were the Stoics, who believed that life should be uh, regimented by discipline and, and, and careful living and modesty and moderation. And so these two opposite thoughts were prevalent in the thinking at the time. Well, you, you go, well, what does that have to do with Israel? Well, Israel was Hellenized in the, the, uh, with the advent of Alexander the Great, and up to this point, now they're with Romans, and Roman thinking was directly derived from Greek thinking. Okay, so what he's doing is actually quoting a line that would be very familiar to the people of the day. <coughs> and he says, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor as is right and do not go on sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. Little caveat, a little uh, rabbit trail there as he kind of prompts them, hey, you know, sin is, sin is still a concern here. You know, he's, the first letter that, uh, earlier in the, the letter that he wrote to them, he's, he's uh, encouraging them, you, you, you can't go on sinning. Uh, he's already talked about casting the, the immoral brother out of the church so that it would not cause more others in the church to sin. Okay? He comes on down, he says, but someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? <clears throat> I've asked that. I don't like the next verse. <laughs> he says, uh, you foolish person. Wow, boy, I feel stupid. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed, its own body. For not all flesh is the same, for there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. The stars differ from stars in glory. Okay, so you get the idea here? There's, there's a whole bunch of different cool things because it's all created of God. And, and the other day, you know, smoke was really bad and um, I was watching as the sun was setting over the mountains and it was this brilliant <coughs> dark red ball. And, and it, was, it was beautiful except for the fact that I couldn't see any mountains for it to set over. I couldn't even see down to the bottom of the hill, but I could see the sun. And a couple hours later, I went out on the deck and I was looking off to the east and here comes the moon rising and, and it's a brilliant ball of red. But it wasn't the same kind as the sun. There, there was a, a marked difference. Um, I love going out on the deck at night and looking at the stars. Uh, I haven't got to do that much lately. I go out and look and I can't see them. But, but I, because there's just, uh, you know, there's the... Uh, there's one off to the south, and, and the name escapes me at the moment. I really love it because it glitters a bright blue. It's, it's brilliant blue. I mean, more brilliant than any sapphire I've ever seen. I love looking at that. It's, it's just beautiful. Uh, then you can see Mars and, and the redness of Mars as it goes across. And, and, and there's just a, a, a beauty amongst the stars, but even amongst the stars, they differ one from another. Um, 42. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown in a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Now, now catch something here real quick. He's not saying we're going to be raised as spirits. Okay? He's saying we will be raised as spiritual <laughs> bodies. Okay? We're not going to be ethereal wisps of whatever floating around. Okay? That's not what, what he's called us to be, what he's created us to be. Because when Jesus was resurrected and he was amongst the people, they could touch him. He ate. He drank. He had a corporal body. Okay? But it was not one sown to death. It was one resurrected in life. Okay? Um, 
Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the first man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as the man is of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Okay, again, he's making a distinction here. Everybody that's born of Adam has been born of the dust. But everybody that has been born of Christ has a spirit. That's what I, that, what I was telling you guys. There is a, a spirit that we were created to have, but when sin came in, when we chose to do things our own way, it died. Okay? And then when we come to salvation, that spirit is birthed anew in us. Okay? Um, just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Verse 50, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. Dennis, that makes you happy, doesn't it? Because what's coming up? Rosh Hashanah. The Feast of Trumpets. <coughs> Man, I can't wait to hear that trumpet sound. <coughs> for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, okay, brothers, because of everything I've said, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your, your labor is not in vain. Okay, so there's a couple of things that I want to draw out here. First resurrection, the first fruits has happened. But was it just Jesus that was resurrected? Oh, come on, don't be scared. No, no. no. no it wasn't. Matter of fact, it says when He gave up His Spirit, it says that the tombs of all the righteous the ancient righteous opened and they came out and they went amongst the people. They came into Jerusalem. Can you say the walking dead? <laughs> Except they weren't doing that whole zombie thing. Okay? Matter of fact, Scripture tells us, um, Psalm 68, it tells us that He will lead a train of captives with Him. And it was those who were held captive by death. Okay? And he led them out of death. And that's why Paul says um, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. As a matter of fact, in, in Philippians, he's, he's talking and he says, you know, uh, I'm kind of torn as to what to do. He said, I, I know I'm at the end of my race. And, and when I depart this, I shall instantaneously, I will, I will be in the presence of the Lord. And that's a, the, the much better alternative. But I'm not sure that my work is done here. And so what shall I do? Because as far as what I want, I want to be go, go and be with my Lord. But for your sake, I think it's necessary that I stay. <coughs> One of the things that I, I really want you to do, I want to challenge you to do, if you are afraid of death, if you are afraid of what comes next, I want to challenge you to do two things, actually three. First thing is, I want you to understand what God's heart is for you. Okay? Because Scripture tells us that God's heart for you is good. That He has good plans for you, that He has good desires for you, that He wants to reward you. When we get to heaven, we're all going to be, all, all that we've done is going to be laid out before us and we're going to be rewarded according to what we've, we, we've done. 
And, and then when we get it all, we gather it up, what are we going to do? We're going to lay it back at His feet. My hope is that I have a lot of stuff. I don't want to walk up with a little coin and say, here, this is what I've got. Okay. So you need to understand that God sees that you are trapped in this life and the sin. Talk about this life. I mean, three hurricanes in the Gulf, following on the heels of Harvey. Um, you know, Irma was the, the supposedly the largest hurricane ever. Um, and then Jose is following along after her. Houston is still trying to get rid of the excess water from Hurricane Harvey. Uh, the Northwest is burning up in fire. Um, but, but see, if, if you're paying attention to those things, you know, Florida is, is dealing with Hurricane Irma. And, and, but did, did, were you aware that over uh, 2,000 people have died in Southeast Asia because of the, the monsoons and the rains and the mudslides? Did you know that in Africa they're dealing with flooding and, and mudslides that, that they're struggling to contain and trying to rescue people from? Southeast Europe is aflame. They're having the same struggles with fires that we're having with here in the United States. Uh, Mexico, the, the earthquake, uh, 650 miles north of the epicenter, buildings were crashing into one another because of the strength of the earthquake. They, they think it's one of the strongest ones to hit Mexico. All creation is groaning. All of creation is longing for its redemption, for its right order to be put into place. So I want you to understand that when God looks at you, He sees the hardship that He did not intend for you to face. He sees the hurt, he sees the woundings. He sees the fear. He sees the anger. He sees all of this stuff that is going on that it was not His heart for you to deal with. Okay? He has something better for you. Not just in this life. Because honestly, I don't know how some people do it without God. Man, if I didn't have God to go to and cry out sometimes... I don't know what I'd do. I'd be a miserable wreck. But he has an eternity planned for you that is very, very good. So that's the first thing. You need to understand God's heart for you. Second, in order to really grasp that, to make that your own, you've got to be intimate with him. How many here know, uh, who, who is our president? Who's our president? How many know? Like everybody should have your hand up. If you don't have your hand up, you may not like him, but that's not what I asked. I just said, who is he? But how many people know him? I don't know. I didn't even watch the stupid TV show. I'm not talking about anything since he's been president. That What's the show called? Apprentice. Apprentice? I thought it was called Trump's beat stick. <laughs> it's whatever. Okay, I, I don't know. I don't know Trump. All I know about Trump is what I read and what I see. But I've never sat down to get to know him. But I know Christy. I know Christy. We, we played a game the other day where you had to, um, there was a question and everybody had to write down what they thought the questioner's answer would be. Oh man, I can guess hers all day long. All day long. All I got to think about is what I really like and do the opposite. <laughs> but it works both ways because she can do the same thing. Okay? How do I know her but I don't know Trump? Trump's in a lot more newspapers than Christy is. Well, because I spend time with her. We're, we're intimate with each other. We, we have conversation that reveals each other's hearts. That's what you need to do with God. Have conversation that, that will open your heart to Him and that allows you to receive His heart for you. Okay? So the first one, know His heart. Two, be intimate that you might know His heart. Three, get in the Word. Get in the Word. He's written out much about His plans for you. He's written a lot. But, but see, the cool thing about it is as much as He's written, our mind still can't conceive what He's prepared for us. 
I mean, he, he made the earth in six days. Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. That was 2,000 years ago. And he's still working. I, I can't even imagine what it's going to be like. So, resurrection from the dead. Uh, real quick, I want to run over a couple things. First, first fruits, Jesus, and those that rose the righteous. Um, second big movement is going to be what? The rapture. Um, That which is holding the enemy back will be taken out of the way. Jesus will appear in the clouds. The church will be raptured up to be with him. Anybody ever think the rapture happened? We had seven people in our house. And I went and took a nap. And I came out from my nap. The cars were still there. There was no sound and no people. <laughs> <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> oh man, this is not good. <laughs> this is really not good. Hello? We're downstairs! Oh, thank God! Oh. <laughs> if you have not been there, I don't recommend you try it. It's scary. But he will call. And he will gather, he will send his angels out to gather those that are his. Okay? First, the dead. Those who have died. And then those who remain alive. I kind of would like to be alive at the time. Um, but I guess I'm okay with it either way. Alright? But um, I, I just think it's going to be cool. To, you know, that's going to be awesome. Because in an instant, we'll be changed. I mean, right now, as hard as I try, I can't fly. <laughs> I, I just doesn't work. I can't even jump as high as I used to could. All right? And, but in, in that instant, we're going to be changed. So that, that's the second resurrection. Okay? Now, there's going to be another type of resurrection uh, that we know of. Uh, going through the tribulation period, the church, I believe, will be out of the way. The enemy will come in and he'll get to do what he wants to do. God will pour out his wrath. But there are going to be those who are saved in that time period. Okay? They are still part of the first type of resurrection. The, the commonality of all of this resurrection is they are resurrected unto newness and eternal life. Okay? This is a resurrection of life. But then there's another kind too, right? Because... After everything is done, the tribulation is done, Jesus comes, he puts his foot on the Mount of Olives, uh, he reigns for a thousand years. Um, the enemy is let loose for a short period of time. The enemy is thrown down. And uh, if you have your Bibles, turn open to Revelation real quick, because this is important that we get this. <clears throat> We're going to turn to Revelation chapter 20. <clears throat> okay, so verse 11. Uh, John is writing, he says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. From his presence earth and sky fled, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. According to what they had done. This is the book of works. Okay? And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. See, this is the second resurrection, the second type 
of resurrection. The first type of which there will be several, <clears throat> there have already been some and there will be several more, is, is a resurrection to life. But this other one, this is for all of those who have not believed. They have not been covered by the blood of Jesus. They stand before God in their sin. The only thing that they have to judge them by is the works they did. But is that going to matter at all? Because they're all going to the same place. I mean, so you did a lot of really good works. Do you get an umbrella in hell? You don't. You are eternally separated from God. You're thrown into the lake of fire. You're thrown into the outer darkness. You are separated forever from who you were intended to worship, to, create, to, to, to be, to bow down to. See, that's the second resurrection. Both of these are physical. I believe both bodies will be changed because those that did not accept Jesus uh, will still have to be immortal because they will suffer for eternity. Okay? Now people go, wow, isn't that unjust? Ask God. I, it wasn't given to me to decide all this. It's only given to me to read it, to understand it, to accept it. I, I don't know why God did a lot of things he did. I don't know why he did this. I don't I don't I got four siblings. They still all got their hair. Okay, God. If that's what you want. But is that sufficient to cause me to not love him? No. You know, I, I don't know why at nine years old I was given diabetes. I don't know why that, that happened. But that's not enough to make me not love him. Okay? So, the resurrection, you need to understand a couple things about it. It's a fulcrum on which our, our faith system rests. Because without the resurrection, uh, we're, we're a people without hope. You, you need to understand that Jesus was the first fruit. He was resurrected into a new type of body, a new type of life. There were those that were resurrected with him uh, at that same time. Uh, some people say there will be another resurrection somewhere in there. I, I, I don't know. I read the scriptures and it could go either way, I guess. I, I think they were already resurrected, but, but the, the righteous from... Uh, the righteous Jews are resurrected at a different time. I think they were resurrected when Jesus was. I, I think Jesus uh, went down and he, he told Abe, he said, hey Abe, let's go. Grab Lazarus and grab Moses and give a shout out to Jacob and, and let's get out of here. And, and he let the great train with him. Okay. But we need to understand, one, that, that, that the resurrection that we have as believers is unto a, a life that is so much better than what we have here. And if you're not a believer, those that don't believe, they're resurrected unto an eternity of death. They're, they're resurrected to judgment. See, that's what's cool about us. We're not resurrected to judgment. Uh, we, we get judged in as much as our works will, we will be rewarded for, but we're not judged as to whether we're in or we're out. Okay, we're, we're already in. So, Resurrection of the dead. Next week we are going to talk about um, <coughs> judgment, eternity. So um, do some looking. Be prepared. Uh, we will wrap up this series. Uh, I'm thinking two weeks hence, uh, and then we're going to move on to the fall feasts uh, as as given to the people of Israel by God. We're going to talk a little bit about the spring feasts and how they have all been fulfilled, and how we are looking to the fall feasts yet to be fulfilled. So that's, that's my next objective after we finish this series. Uh, bow your heads if you would. <coughs> Father, we thank you that we have a hope. That we can look with excited expectation. With anticipation. To what comes next. That we can look forward to something that is so much better than anything we've experienced here that it doesn't even compare. We can't even conceive it. Help us, Father, to live in that excitement. To live in that anticipation. And I thank you that you sent your son that we would have this opportunity. 
that he went to the cross willingly in our place. Even when he could have called for deliverance, for rescue, he chose to die in our place. Thank you for your grace. For your mercy. For your love. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.